What do angels do in heaven? Number one, they worship God. Around God's throne, we witness countless angels worshiping. Do you wonder what heaven looks like? What are the cherubim, ophanim, and other angels doing? What a fantastic experience it would be to be able to see inside the throne room of God and witness what is going on in heaven. John is granted the opportunity, and he relates to us what he observed during his time there. There are three key texts in the Bible that describe heaven. Two of these texts are found in the Old Testament, while the third can be found in Revelation 4. What do you think we will see in heaven? In heaven, John notices an open door. The trumpet-like voice that spoke to John at the beginning tells him to come up. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the voice of the living creatures and the elders. And they numbered myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, innumerable, saying in a loud voice, Worthy and deserving is the Lamb that was sacrificed to receive power, and riches and wisdom, and might and honor, and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, there is a description of the angels prompting the elders to worship. However, in this passage, the elders seem to be prompting the angels instead. This creates a beautiful cycle of encouragement and praise between the angels and elders in heaven as they continue to inspire each other to offer more and more praise to the great Redeemer. As a result, the angels and the elders fall down before the Lamb together and raise their voices in unison to glorify Him. Their number was countless, consisting of 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. This is an innumerable company of angels. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The angels, in their song, did not offer praise for their own redemption since they are not believed to be the subjects of this redemption. However, they are keen observers of it and are therefore able to praise God for it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them that their services, their prophecies regarding grace, were not meant for themselves and their time. But for you, in these things, the death, resurrection, and glorification of Jesus Christ, which have now been told to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the power of the Holy Spirit who was sent from heaven, and to these things even the angels long to look. The angels are able to see the greatness of God's work in redeeming fallen men. Therefore, they credit power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing to the Lamb in response. Similarly, we can also praise God for the way He works in the lives of others. All of creation praises both the Father and the Lamb. Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. And I heard every created thing that is in heaven or on earth or under the earth, in Hades, the realm of the dead, or on the sea, and everything that is in them, saying together, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, Christ, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever, every creature. John's description is comprehensive, including all creatures in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and in the sea. This combined worship of the Father and the Lamb is strong testimony to the divinity of Jesus. There cannot be the slightest doubt that the Lamb is to be reckoned with God and as God. We read, fell down and worshipped him. The word worshipped in ancient Greek means to prostrate or to lay before another in complete submission. This suggests that the elders may have fallen down to their knees and laid themselves before the one who lives forever and ever as an expression of their complete submission and worship. This is the method of adoration in the East. First, the worshiper kneels down, then bowing down, touches the ground with their forehead. This latter act is called prostration. We read, forever and ever, worshiped him who lives forever and ever. The eternal God reigns. The Caesars come and go, even those who persecute God's people. But the Lord lives forever and is worthy of our praise. Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes all over and within, underneath their wings. And day and night, they never stop saying, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all, who was and who is and who is to come, the unchanging, eternal God. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanksgiving to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne, and they worship Him who lives forever and ever, and they throw down their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For you created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created and brought into being. They do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. The cherubim continually utter the phrase, Holy, holy, holy. This phrase is used to declare and emphasize God's holy nature and character. In Hebrew, repeating a word twice adds emphasis, while repeating it three times designates the superlative and highlights the infinite holiness of God. We read, They do not rest. The cherubim declared that the Lord God is almighty. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, the ancient Greek word used is pantocrator, which means the one who has his hand on everything. They have no rest, yet they are not restless either. The sweet contentment they experience in their continual employment is easier to believe than to describe. The worship of the 24 elders is inspired by the cherubim, who worship God without ceasing. This should serve as an example for us to also worship God since we have no less reason to praise and thank Him. Even though birds sing without ceasing, they have far less to sing about compared to us. Similarly, even though angels constantly worship God, they were never redeemed by the blood of Christ, unlike us. Therefore, we should strive to emulate the angels and sing to God day and night, pouring forth our souls in sacred songs. 24 elders worship God, which means they acknowledge His worth and worthiness. They gave credit to God for their own work and reward, and they did this by casting their crowns before His throne. They recognize that the worth and worthiness belong to God, not to themselves. The act of casting the crowns was a declaration that God is worthy of receiving glory, honor, and power. This act was similar to a practice in the Roman Empire, where lesser kings would lay down their crowns before the emperor as a sign of homage. The emperor would then return the crowns to demonstrate that their right to rule, victory, and crowns came from him. This illusion also refers to the custom of prostrations in the East and the homage of petty kings acknowledging the supremacy of the emperor. God has the right to rule over us as our creator. We can either accept and enjoy this fact or reject it, which may lead to frustration. It's important to recognize our limited and dependent nature as creatures before God. The Bible mentions God's power displayed in creating and governing the world twice, emphasizing that it is truly worthy of our admiration and praise. Even in the last days, we see the angels worship Jesus, and the Bible tells us why. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Revelation chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. And I saw a strong angel announcing with a loud voice, Who is worthy, having the authority and virtue, to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven, or on earth, or under the earth, in Hades, the realm of the dead, was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. We read, Who is worthy to open the scroll? and to loose its seals. A strong angel searched the entire universe to find someone worthy to open a particular scroll, but found no creature capable of doing so. This is because only God, who is above all created beings, can determine the course of history and unfold the plan contained in the scroll. John wept because the completion of history seemed indefinitely postponed. To open the scroll, one must have the right and the ability to possess it, but no creature was found worthy. Only the Lion of the tribe of Judah is deemed worthy to open the scroll. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Then one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look closely. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has overcome and conquered. He can open the scroll and break its seven seals. And there between the throne with the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb, Christ standing, bearing scars and wounds, as though it had been slain.
with seven horns, complete power, and with seven eyes, complete knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God who have been sent on duty into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. An elder, not an angel, rescued John from his grief by showing him the one who has prevailed to open the scroll. This one was the great figure of Old Testament prophecy, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, Messiah of Israel, and the Gentiles. The Lamb is presented in a way that evokes sympathy and power. Although he is alive and stands as a Lamb, he still bears the marks of a previous sacrifice upon him, as though he had been slain. No created being was found worthy to take the scroll. Only the Lamb, who has demonstrated his rank, character, and ability to take the scroll and open it, can dictate the destiny of creation. His work on the cross has permanently proven his worthiness. Praise to the Worthy One. The Song of the Elders and the Cherubim. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, Christ, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of fragrant incense, which are the prayers of the saints, God's people. And they sang a new song of glorious redemption, saying, Worthy and deserving are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of royal subjects and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. When the Lamb took the scroll, high-ranking angels and redeemed humans worshipped him immediately. We read, Each having a harp, According to the definition, the harp is a zither or a type of guitar that can be played using either the hand or a pick. Music accompanies worship in heaven, which is why many people think that those in heaven will have harps. We read, And they sang a new song. A new song can mean either an excellent song, as new songs were usually most valued, or what I prefer, a new song with regards to its content. Under the Old Testament, the servants of God could not bless God for the actual redemption of man through the blood of Christ, but only rejoice in hope, embracing the promises seen afar, off by the eye of faith. They sing, You are worthy. In the days of the Apostle John, Roman emperors were celebrated upon their arrival with the Latin expression, Ver dignus, which is translated as, You are worthy. Here the true ruler of the world is honored. The focus of Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 was on God's work of creation. But now in this song, the emphasis is on his work of redemption. The song pays homage to the price of redemption, which was paid by saying, For you were slain. It also honors the work of redemption by acknowledging that you have redeemed us. The ultimate destination of redemption is to God, and the payment for it was made through the blood of Jesus. The scope of redemption is for every tribe, tongue, people and nation. The length of redemption is that it has made us kings and priests to our God. Finally, the result of redemption is that we shall reign on the earth. David also tells us that angels worship the Lord and offer praises to him. Psalm chapter 148 verse 2. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts, armies. The psalmist considered that all heavenly creatures and celestial bodies should offer their praise to Yahweh. The God of Israel was not a deity confined to a certain region or people, but rather the supreme ruler over all creation, deserving of honor and worship from all beings in the highest places. Psalm 19 states that the glory of God is proclaimed by the heavens through their very existence. The psalmist urges all creatures to join in this praise and continue to glorify God, the psalmist specifically calls upon the angels to offer praise to God, just as they do constantly in the presence of God's throne. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. The faithful angels are like a great army, also known as all his hosts. Throughout history, people have been tempted to worship angels, but they are merely our fellow servants. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one defraud you of your prize, your freedom in Christ and your salvation, by insisting on mock humility and the worship of angels. Going into detail about visions, he claims, he has seen to justify his authority, puffed up in conceit by his unspiritual mind. The shepherds during the birth of Jesus also noticed this. 
Bethlehem shepherds were responsible for taking care of the temple flock, which may have included the lambs used in temple sacrifices. Suddenly, on a quiet and dark night, an angel appeared and the glory of the Lord shone brightly, interrupting the calmness of the night. Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord flashed and shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For this day in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. And this will be a sign for you, by which you will recognize him. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, angelic army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is well pleased. The first preacher of the gospel was an angel. God has now given this honor to the ministers. After the announcement of a single angel, a whole group of angels appeared, known as the heavenly host. This group of angels were like a band of soldiers who proclaimed peace to the world. Even then and even now, the world is in need of peace. The contrast between the glorious angels and the humble Jesus must have seemed extreme. But God loves to display His glory in unlikely packages so that His glory is more clearly revealed. The writer of Hebrews lets us know the reason why the angels praise and worship Jesus. Jesus is superior to the angels because angels worship and serve Jesus, who is their God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. And when he again brings the firstborn, highest ranking son, into the world, he says, And all the angels of God are to worship him. And concerning the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds, and his ministering servants flames of fire to do his bidding? This word had a dual meaning as it was used to refer to an idea and also to designate the one who was born first. The firstborn son was considered to be first in line and would receive the position of favor and honor. Therefore, the title firstborn was indicative of one's high position and honor. Rabbis used the title firstborn to refer to the Messiah. One ancient rabbi wrote, God said, As I made Jacob a firstborn, so also will I make King Messiah a firstborn. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Let all the angels of God worship him. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43 indicates that Jesus is superior because angels worship him, not the other way around. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. The angels worship him. He does not worship among them. Psalm 104, verse 4 shows the Messiah, Jesus, is Lord over the angels who serve him. Psalm 104, verse 4. Who makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his ministers? Jesus is superior to the angels because the Father himself calls him, and not any angel. God and Lord Yahweh has shown in Psalm chapter 45, verses 6 through 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, virtue, morality, justice, and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you above your companions with the oil of jubilation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But about the Son, the Father says to him, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of absolute righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. Jesus is superior to the angels because he completed his work and sat down, while the angels continue to work without rest. This is evident from Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. Angels are not governing spirits, but rather ministering spirits, and they are called to serve instead of ruling. On the other hand, it is an essential aspect of the angel's nature to be servants. While the angels are commanded to serve God, he shares his servants with redeemed men and women. This demonstrates God's great love for us and his desire to share everything with us. One of the basic descriptions of angels is this. They worship. Angels are worship leaders. There are images of angels on some altars in the great cathedrals. 
In this art, angels are portrayed offering incense, that is, the people's prayers. Praying, interceding, and worshiping are the responsibilities of angels. Angels are ministers in a story about God. Fascination with angel messengers can creep dangerously close to idolatry. Through the course of history, people have repeatedly fallen into the trap of worshiping angels rather than God. In point of fact, the Apostle Paul cautioned the church in Colossus against worshiping angels. The Apostle John needed to be told not to worship an angel when one appeared to him. Angels worship God. Angels that don't summon us to see God are not doing God's work. Rather, they are the rebellious bad angels, often called demons or evil spirits. As the incredible multitude glorifies God, the others in heaven are compelled to merge their voices in praise. Around the throne, all created beings join in. As these other beings hear the adoration the great multitude brings to God, they see more clearly the power and wisdom and majesty of God. They can worship God all the more by witnessing the salvation He brought to the incredible multitude. The company of faithful angels is like a great army, all His hosts. Other angelic beings fell because they would not properly honor God. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven. O star of the morning, light bringer, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the ground. You who have weakened the nations, king of Babylon. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the remote parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But in fact, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the remote recesses of the pit, the region of the dead. Isaiah also shows us this. Isaiah sees the throne of heaven. Isaiah is also given the opportunity to see heaven, and after spending some time there, he reports back to us what he saw while he was there. Isaiah was a prophet who lived in Jerusalem and was sent by God to communicate with the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. He began by proclaiming a message of the judgment of God. He warned the corrupt leaders of Israel that their disobedience against their covenant with God would have consequences. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 2. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim were standing above him, each having six wings. With two each covered his face, and with two each covered his feet, and with two each flew. There is a throne in heaven, and the Lord God, in his role as the supreme ruler of everything, sits on it. The fact that there is already someone sitting on the throne in heaven is the most important aspect of the heavenly realm. Those who have the rightful authority and the right to rule sit on thrones. It's possible that Isaiah became discouraged or depressed as a result of the death of a prominent figure in the kingdom of Judah during his ministry. God in heaven now shows Isaiah, as if to say, don't worry about it, Isaiah. Uzziah may not be on his throne, but I am on my throne. We read, above it stood seraphim. The seraphim surrounded the throne of God in this passage. The angels are referred to as cherubim in Psalm and Ezekiel, as well as in a number of other passages. According to Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, these angels are also referred to as living creatures. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, And in front of the throne there was something like a sea or large expanse of glass, like the clearest crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living creatures who were full of eyes in front and behind, seeing everything and knowing everything that is around them. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, the Apostle John also mentions their six wings. Seraphim are one of the two types of heavenly beings mentioned by Isaiah, the other being cherubim. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Cherubim have a single pair of wings, are associated closely with the throne presumably by guardians, while the seraphim are flying above it. The word seraphim comes from the Hebrew word for burning, which may be why some people connect them with lightning. However, in other contexts, the seraphim are associated not with fire, but with serpents, which may be a reference to the metaphoric burn of venom. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. And one called out to another, saying, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. In this context, the seraphim are not speaking directly to the Lord God. They are praising his glorious character to one another in the presence of the Lord. The phrase, holy, 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 appears in the Bible twice, once in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, and once in the New, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Both times, the phrase is spoken or sung by heavenly creatures both times, and both times it appears in a vision of a man being brought to God's throne, first by the prophet Isaiah and subsequently by the apostle John. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around even under its wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The holiness of David is the most difficult of all God's traits to express. Holiness is not something we inherit as a part of our nature. We only become holy in relationship to Christ. It's a sanctity that's been ascribed to you. It is an imputed holiness. Only in Christ do we become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made Christ who knew no sin to judiciously be sin on our behalf, so that in Him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to Him and placed in a right relationship with Him by His gracious loving kindness. God's holiness is what distinguishes Him from all other beings, what separates Him from everything else. God's holiness is not just about his sinless purity or perfection, but is also representative of the core of his otherness, his transcendence. It is a mystery that makes us marvel at his awesomeness and fills us with wonder as we try to understand at least a fraction of his majestic nature. In this vision depicted in Isaiah 6, Isaiah witnessed personally God's holiness Isaiah, while being a prophet of God and a blameless man, was aware of his own sinfulness. Isaiah and John, on the other hand, paint a united picture of our holy, magnificent, and glorious God, who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's holiness is eternal, just as He is eternal. The seraphim, in fact, spend their days and nights worshiping God for His holiness. During this never-ending worship, they exclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. The significance of the seraphim's close proximity to God, combined with their revelatory praise, cannot be overstated. When the seraphim say, The whole earth is full of His glory, they are giving a first-hand account of what they see from heaven's apex. We can see from the seraphim's supernatural perspective that God's glory is infinite, indescribably valuable, and so powerful that it cannot be contained in a single realm. His glory bursts through heaven, unfolds through the spiritual realm, and overflows into the entire earth. This revealed glory allows us to catch a sacred glimpse of a holy God. To be holy means to be distinguished and revered. The trihagen, the thrice invocation of holy, is the seraphim's worship of God, which is significant. It is significant that the seraphim in Isaiah's vision use a threefold repetition of God's holiness, known as the trihagen. The number three represented completeness and stability in ancient Judaism, and it is used here to connote God's wholeness at the beginning, middle, and end. Announcing God's holiness three times implies God's eternal nature, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. God's divine perfection as manifested in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's total and supreme holiness, unrivaled by anything or anyone. So, what are we to take away for ourselves today in reading these vivid images of the throne room of God? Number one, see the Lord in his splendor. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 through 2. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And where will my resting place be? For all these things my hand has made. So all these things came into being by and for me, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look 
graciously, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit and who reverently trembles at my word and honors my commands, be struck by the glory of the Lord. Understand what he asks of his people since he is the almighty God. He demands submissiveness from us, a yielding heart that trembles at the very words of God and desires to obey. Number two, the greatness of God. One should instead place all the details in the broader perspective of their function to reveal the greatness of God's court, hence his own greatness. Thus, they also show strikingly contrast with the pretense of the earthly ruler's arrogant pomp. The text invites us to worship today, no less than at its first reading in Ephesus. It also invites us to relinquish our fear of human grandeur, which pales before the majesty of the eternal God with whom we have become intimate. Number three, invitation to praise. The manner that these beings worship compels us to offer praise in a manner similar to theirs. Worship that focuses on God's worthiness, both his character and deeds, is our closest foretaste of heaven in the present life. Psalm 150, verse 2. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the abundance of his greatness. Worship also reminds us that whatever else are calling or gifts now, all Christians become God's worshipers. Our devotion to God will always rise. Seraphim's ministry is to extol the name and character of God in heaven. Because they are positioned above the throne, their ministry is directly related to God in his heavenly throne, as opposed to the cherubim who are beside it. The seraphim's functions have not always been agreed upon by Bible scholars, but one thing is certain, they are constantly glorifying God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The book of Hebrews also shows us this point. Hebrews paints Jesus as the ultimate revelation of God, superior to the prophets or the angels. Jesus is the exact representation of God and has a position above everyone. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus displayed his strength in creation and salvation. He is the strongest leader and even the angels follow him. Angels serve as a wonderful example for Christians to follow in terms of obeying the Lord and giving praise to His name. To tell the truth, we can join the worship of the angels in praising God and say with the psalmist, Psalm 150, verse 6, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 7, verses 11 through 12. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Like the poem reads, Praises to the Savior give. He who died that we might live, for his love so great, so free. Praise his name eternally. When our hearts were steeped in sin, vile and wretched were within. Jesus left the throne above, came to show the Father's love. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I am humbled and grateful for the countless blessings that you have showered upon my life. Your grace has provided me with far more than I could have ever imagined. You have surrounded me with a community of people who are always there for me, offering their unwavering support and love. My family and friends bless me every day with their kind words and actions, and their presence in my life uplifts my spirit in ways that keep my eyes fixed on you. I thank you for the abundance of joy and love that fills my life, and for the peace that comes with knowing that you are always with me. Dear Lord, I want to express my gratitude for the safety and protection you provide me. Your divine presence keeps me safe from all the dangers and negative influences that seem to surround others. I am grateful for your guidance and support in making better choices and for sending me wise advisors to help me navigate through life's complex decisions. I am amazed by the many ways you speak to me. 
Through your words, I find comfort and reassurance that you are always with me, guiding me towards the right path. Lord, I am also thankful for the safety and happiness you provide to those around me. I pray that you continue to bless them with your love and protection. Please grant me the wisdom and compassion to show my loved ones how much they matter to me. I hope that I can be a source of kindness and support to them, just as they have been to me. Lastly, I want to express my deep gratitude for all the blessings you have bestowed upon me. Your grace and mercy have been abundant in my life, and I pray that I never forget to acknowledge and appreciate them. I promise to show my gratitude through my words and actions, and to always remember your love and kindness. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Amen. However, the things in the Bible many people do not know. Things Yahweh means that many people don't know. <laughs> 